Welcome to session 41 of these weekly events that we put on featuring experts in tech, specifically non-technical roles. That's our focus here at School 16. Today's conversation is going to be focused on how to stand out for product marketing roles in tech. And we're fortunate to be uh, here with Sanjana, Director of Product Marketing at Salesforce. Sergey and I spent a lot of time in Salesforce in our careers and Dreamforce. And, you know, uh, it, it's, it's, it's a tool that is actually incredibly effective, also incredibly complicated sometimes for people to learn, uh, but is used all around the world by some of the best companies and is still one of the leading CRMs out there uh, and doing a lot of innovation there as well. So I'm sure the product marketing role is really challenging and interesting too. Uh, just to get you guys started here, School 6 in the school where we help people learn skills to land non-technical opportunities in tech. And today's conversation over the next hour, we're going to wrap up our introduction in a few minutes here. Uh, we're going to hear an intro from Sanjana and how she became a product marketer without being technical. That's the caveat here. Uh, and then the rest of our conversation is going to be focused uh, on how to stand out for product marketing opportunities in tech. It is a very exciting field now. A lot of people are interested in. A lot of people also don't know exactly what it means. A lot of companies are doing it differently as well. So I think there's some standards that are being created right now for what that function means without a technology company. And we're going to dig into what it means to be an effective product marketer and what uh, technology companies look for when recruiting those folks into those roles. And maybe what other stepping stone roles you can take, right? If you're new to tech, what should you do before you go after a product marketing opportunity. Uh, it says here that the Q&A is the last 10 minutes. Uh, actually, we're going to look at the questions as they come in. So feel free to drop them even five minutes into the conversation. If something comes up top of mind that is relevant, we encourage you to drop that conversation as well. Uh, and again, if you're looking to advance your career in tech beyond coming to these weekly sessions, we are recruiting for our next cohort for our technology career acceleration program that's starting in September. We've already had a few hundred people apply to the 20 or so seats that are available in the program. So if you're interested, do apply soon. Uh, we try to keep it accessible, provide scholarship opportunities for folks that need it. And so we encourage you to apply at school forward slash apply. All right, we're going to stop sharing the screen here, and we're going to jump into the conversation with Sandra. So, you want to kick us off with the first question? Yeah. So, you know, I would love to hear if you can kind of think back, Sandra, back to when you were in college. I, you know, from I know from our previous conversation that there was an interest in tech. How were you thinking about, you know, what you were going to do when you graduated, and how you would take advantage of internships and the like to be able to get your foot in the door? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, I guess first of all. Hi everyone that's here. Uh, it's great to be here. So thanks for the invitation um, to chat with you guys. Um, you know, for me, tech was the last thing on my mind when I got to college. Um, it, it, it developed into a passion, but you know, when I was in high school, I was really into writing and journalism. And I always thought like, you know, I'm, I'm gonna be a journalist. I'm gonna go to school for it and all of that. And then uh, we had a recession and I changed my mind. And I said, well, okay, I got to study business or I got to do something that would give me um, a higher earning potential once I graduate. And um, I'm from the Bay Area, from San Jose, born and raised, so in the heart of the Silicon Valley. And so, um, you know, getting a, an internship in, in tech, per se, uh, during college, it was not um, as... Uh, it, it wasn't as sought after in, in like the startup romanticization kind of sense that it is now, but um, it was definitely popular. You know, all of my peers were like, hey, I'm going to go work at whatever company my dad works at or, you know, my friend works at. And so that's where I really started. And um, my first internship was at a semiconductor company, uh, which is no longer around, uh, but called National Semiconductor. It's now uh, part of Texas Instruments. Um, and I thought I was going to hate it, honestly. And I ended up loving it, not because I understood all the, you know, nuts and bolts of what was going on, but because I got to dive into something that I didn't understand and make it really consumable to more people. So at the time, uh, they were building um, semiconductor chips for um, electric vehicles. And so it was super interesting from a use case perspective and the types of questions that I could ask. Um, my product managers, my engineers were actually questions that led me to thinking through, okay, how do I message this to a broader audience? And I didn't know that that exercise in itself of like being curious and then distilling information was product marketing, but it is, you know, like, and that's where I kind of got hooked. And um, 
kept working in technology in different companies here and there. I went to school in New York. Um, so, you know, the startup scene was starting to, to bubble up while I was in college, um, worked every summer when I was home and uh, here I am. Couldn't get enough of it. <laughs> awesome. Uh, well, glad that you found your pathway into tech. I mean, of course, you know, maybe when, you, when you're from San Jose and you're in Silicon Valley, you could, we kind of maybe take it for granted when, when we're in these tech hubs because yeah. it seems like tech is everywhere and that's what everybody's doing. And so maybe sometimes you feel like, especially in college, like maybe let's see what else is out there. Mm -hmm. uh, but in the end of the day, there's a reason why it's popular. There's so much job creation. I mean, you can you can make six-figure salary even in your 20s sometimes if you if you excel in, in these various roles. And so it makes sense. It makes sense why, why it's attractive to folks. But let, let's talk about that kind of trajectory. You mentioned you, you joined the semiconductor company. Uh, was it kind of random that the internship or the, or the role that you got in the company or did you specifically want to work in that department? And, and tell us a little bit about kind of what, what was the initial um, kind of exposure that you had into tech and the kind of day-to-day -day you had in your job back then? Yeah, yeah. So this was a, an internship after my freshman year of college. And, you know, a family member was working at this company and was like, hey, like, you need a job? Like, we need interns. Like, we need cheap labor. So, <laughs> you know, come on over. And I had just been told, like, you know, product marketing is like the, th the thing in marketing you should do. I had no, I had no evidence to support this. I had no, no reason to think that other than people told me that. And that was the position they needed help with. And, you know, my day-to-day -day was pretty, um, diverse in terms of the things that I got exposure to and honestly was kind of a uh, without me knowing it was um, really a model for what my career would become like no day is the same for me still um, now at Salesforce however many years later um, but in that internship I did everything I mean I did everything from you know every Monday um, or actually three days a week we would have like a competitive newsletter go out so I would scrape through like all of these publications and do write-ups of different <clears throat> products that were being launched in market and write up this competitive newsletter for all of marketing. Like that was one of my things. Another thing was um, putting together our first solution brief for that chip that I, I mentioned that we were building for electric vehicles. So that was meeting with the PMs, figuring out what, what are we building? What's the core technology? What do we need to explain um, to, to buyers? And, and um, how do we do that <clears throat> effectively in, in layman's terms? Um, I also got exposure to the packaging side of the house, which, you know, from a software perspective is usually just pricing, but for semiconductors, it's at the actual physical packaging that you're putting uh, our semiconductor chips into. So that was pretty interesting, um, but no day was the same. And it was really just navigating through, like, how do we, how do we make semiconductors cool and make them easy to understand? I'm sure a challenge uh, for sure, but it might depend on who, who you're targeting for your customers. Um, okay, I think a lot of people get confused because you have product management, which is one thing. You have marketing and now you have product marketing. So if you were to tell us kind of like the biggest difference between marketing broadly and product marketing, uh, how would you describe that? So I will answer that first by making it a little more confusing, which is that every company sees it differently. And... The general rule of thumb is that at a hardware company, your product managers can also be your product marketers, like you own a product line. Whereas in software, you generally have discrete roles for product management, product marketing, and then what some people would call Marcom or marketing communications or corporate marketing, demand gen, that sort of thing. So I would say that the, the real divisions between those three roles are in product management, you are defining the roadmap, you are defining product requirements, you are working with your engineering team to make them a reality. So you are a builder. Um, I'm gonna skip product marketing with the function of explaining what it is, but um, for kind of like core marketing, Marcom type stuff, you're building demand for a product. So that's everything from email marketing to events, to uh, the website, like all of that kind of stuff sort of sits over here. And in the middle is product marketing. And what product marketing is in charge of doing is working with product management on figuring out what's on the roadmap. What do we launch? How do we move this product forward through our launch strategy, our press strategy, our analyst strategy? And then we work with marketing communications to figure out how to distribute that message 
and to drive pipeline that our sales teams can then go and and uh, and you know sell products to. And so I would add another dimension there too of that product marketing not only sits between product management and marketing communications, but also between sales because we are responsible for driving pipeline that sales can go and close. And a lot of that demystification of what's happening on the product side is in service of selling more products and, and all of that kind of stuff. So. so then can you explain why then if you have the product builders here and you have the marketers here who are actually helping spread the word, why, why do you need that product marketer in the middle to make it yeah. all happen? Yeah. So what you need, what you need product marketers for is to be that translator. So you really need someone who's able to look at, you know, a product that we're building, even if it's in the nascent stages, right? Even if we don't even know what it's going to look like, who's going to use it. You need someone that understands the industry, that understands the use cases that that product might be applicable to, and that can translate what's being built into messaging and positioning that is viable in the market. And so the marketing communications folks, what they really know are audiences. Like they know like, okay, this developer audience is really going to resonate with this product or, you know, our, our audiences and these geos are going to be more or less receptive to this message. And they know the systems really well. They know, you know, all of the, um, you know, the back how to how to pull those levers but you need product marketing to develop that messaging and positioning that is utilized in all of those channels got it so it sounds like messaging is and positioning is probably the the most important skill would you say to number one okay so then let's back into that a little bit um you you also went from hardware to software so we want to dig into that in a second but um does that mean that you're really looking for people that are really strong copywriters, uh, you know, when someone's applying for a product marketing role on your team, what kind of background typically do you see them coming from where you're like, okay, this person's likely to be good? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. And I think like, I think any product marketer might have a different lens to it. For me personally, I think having a diverse set of experiences can only make you a better product marketer. I mean, I have now been working in AI for, you know, eight and a half years. And I have never taken one computer science course in my life. Um, and I think that having studied psychology and creative writing and done all this other creative stuff makes me a stronger product marketer because of that. And so the two things that I look for in an interview with a product marketer, you know, resume aside is, are you able to develop a strong point of view and advocate for it? Because in that sort of mix that I just described of where product marketing sits, you better believe you got to have a strong point of view. Otherwise you'll get kicked around by all those different stakeholders. So um, do you, can you develop a strong point of view? And then also, are you someone that can connect the dots? You know, obviously product marketing is a very cross-functional role. So can you work just as well with marketing communications as you can with product managers, as with engineers, as with sales leaders? Like it's a very multifaceted role. And so those are the types of things that I look for in terms of a resume. I mean, I think it's, it's always a plus if someone has like actual product marketing experience. Right. But I think it's very hard to tell from just a resume, how good someone is going to be at product marketing. You know, I mean, I work with product marketers who used to be educators and, you know, they were, you know, one of my colleagues was a preschool teacher and she went to business school, got an internship at Salesforce and, now she's a really fantastic product marketer. And I see that path because, you know, as an educator, you need to know how to translate complexity to different audiences, especially to children. So, you know, that skill set, that way of thinking actually translates really, really well into product marketing. Um, but there's also, you know, at a place like Salesforce, there's so many different roles within product marketing too where, you know, for instance, if you are focused on a go-to-market role, or rather you're focused on uh, working with a sales team and owning a, a pipeline number, some quantitative skills might be more important than core messaging and positioning skills, right? So maybe someone with a consulting background or someone that has had a more quantitative role in, in the past uh, would be a fit there. So I think it really depends 
for me, uh, meeting a person is more important than the resume um, and being able to assess that um, ability to create a point of view and to, to build relationships and, and connect the dots within an organization. Interesting. Uh, so I can definitely see how people from all sorts of backgrounds could be a good fit. But, you know, if I'm, let's say, you know, let's say I'm an, I'm, I'm an account manager somewhere and I'm in customer or I'm in customer success and I'm a little bit further away from that. Uh, from from having ever really worked on messaging and positioning or aside from communicating some things to clients, really working with a, a bunch of different stakeholders, what advice would you give me to skill up so that I can in one day in the future uh, be an attractive candidate for a product marketing role? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think like it's both a gift and a curse that all this stuff is available online right now. I mean, I could probably list off different courses people could take. I mean, the Product Marketing Alliance has a good one. And, um, you know, there's a ton of stuff. Um, I will say for my own journey, I mean, before I got to Salesforce, I was a product marketer at two different startups. And you can't really say you're just a product marketer when you're at a startup because you're doing everything. And so a part of the interview process at Salesforce, once you get through kind of informational one-on-ones is, and this is boilerplate, we do this for every product marketing role, we do it today. Um, is that you're given a prompt and um, it's usually something around, you know, building a first call deck or rather a sales deck for how to pitch a product. And um, you have to put it together and present it to a, a panel of, of Salesforce product marketers. It's super nerve wracking. And it was really, um, it, it made me really nervous when I, when I got in that prompt, you know, four years ago when I interviewed here, but you know, the cheat codes are online. Every single presentation we've ever given at a dream course is on YouTube. And so what I did was I just, you know, took myself to Salesforce school. I went online. I looked at every Einstein AI presentation I could find on there. I even found some Dreamforce presentations where um, a VP who ended up being my boss uh, was talking about how to do product marketing at Salesforce, how to do storytelling at Salesforce. So, you know, the information's out there. It's really just um, how you target it and, and, and really, um, you know, uh, uh, make use of it. So that, that sounds like I love that strategy of going through and watching those videos. And for anybody that's interviewing for, especially a larger company where there probably are, there probably is content online where they talk about their products. What a great way to learn how to present the company from the, their own perspective, using their own language. So that by the time you're interviewing, they already feel like you're already kind of a part of the team. And you can do this for a number of roles um, that, that would make you seem like a good candidate, not just product marketing. So I, I love that strategy. But you know, one thing that you mentioned uh, at the top of the hour here when we started this conversation is that, of course, product marketing, even as a role, means so many different things across different companies. And since you've done product marketing in a couple of different organizations, a large organization like Salesforce and, and startups, can you talk about some of the differences? And, and also, you know, if I'm starting off and I'm interested in a career, how can, I, how can I make a decision as to what type of product marketing role or at what type of company I would be most successful? What tree should I be sort of barking up if I really want to be a product marketer? Yeah, yeah. So, you know, I think for me, my journey you know, for my own career path, I'll say that it all happened the way it should, was supposed to, but, you know, other people will say it differently based on their experience. For me, I went small and then went to a larger company. Um, I think it's more popular to do it the opposite way where, you know, fresh out of school, you're, you're at a big company and then you, you apply those skills to a smaller place. But I think um, from my perspective, because I had worked a lot in college, by the time I had graduated, I was like, all right, I've done a little bit of Marcom. I've done a little bit of product marketing. I've done some growth marketing. I've done a lot of marketing stuff. I know I want to specialize a little bit more in product marketing. And um, frankly, a startup was a place where I got my first, got a job, you know? Hey, you want to pay me to like do things? Sure. Great. Um, health insurance? Great. That sounds awesome. Um, so, you know, on the startup side, um, I would say the way I describe it is that there's a lot more, um, you know, emotional complexity to working at a startup. I mean, I was working at like, I was like employee number 28 or 30 or something at my first job. And so you get really close with these folks and 
you know, as a company grows and changes, you know, leaders leave, you know, entire departments are changed, product strategy changes, and you have the keys to the messages that are being put out in market. Like if I sent the wrong email to our customers, like there's a consequence, you know, if I put something wrong on the website, our investors are going to notice. So it's a really different connection to your work that I think for me was a great training ground of being really meticulous and being really detail oriented and understanding the impact of the words that I was putting out there, right, from a marketing perspective. And um, the first job that I had was actually, I mean, it was at an AI company, but it was really a math company. I mean, it's a company that was founded out of the, the Stanford math department. And so there were like, you know, a handful of marketers, if even that, and we were mostly working with data scientists. So being able to sit next to these folks and like have lunch with them every day and have them explain some of the most complicated math concepts that we were building into our product was super, super valuable, such that when I came to Salesforce to a bigger company, it just came naturally to me to, to build those connections, to connect the dots, as I said, of, hey, what are we actually building? How does that translate to customer value? And, you know, where do we need to be telling these stories in market in order to move um, this product forward? So, um, you know, I think that going from a small company to a big company, big company to a small company, it doesn't matter the, which way you do it. I think what matters is that you stay the course on like, if, if product marketing is the thing that you're interested in, like there's going to be a million distractions, but you know, continuing to develop relationships with product, with sales and understanding how all of it works together will always be important. I mean, you asked like, you know, how should people think about what type of product marketing? I would say if you're getting started, don't even think about it. Just get exposure to different pieces of, of the puzzle. And, um, you know, at different size companies, there are different roles that are great transition roles. Like at Salesforce, we have a role called, um, called customer marketing, which, you know, is a role that requires you to interface directly with customers for a given product and make sure that we're marketing the right use cases for what they're using our products for. It's not exactly product marketing, but they interface directly with product marketing and a ton of people make that transition. So um, just like networking with folks at companies and figuring out like, what are those po popular pathways that people take, especially if you have a non-traditional background. And actually, I think the reason why that's such good advice is, you know, even though we might come up with a model that worked for you, for example, in your career, or a common model at a place like Salesforce, these things are constantly in flux. And because they're constantly changing, like product marketing, for example, as a discipline, it has really matured, I believe, in the last five years. But also because so many companies doing it, are doing it differently, that's the work that you have to do. Network your way. I mean, if you're in a company like Salesforce in a big company already, network your way into other departments. If you're not, you can do that work and the outreach to make sure that you're connecting with people to learn what the actual path might be and then see what could fit, you know, you and your background and the like. Yeah. You know, I'm curious, especially because you mentioned, I mean, you, you went to one of those product marketing roles was at a AI company. It seems like it's probably a pretty technical product. Since you weren't technical yourself, and I mean, I even see one of your titles at a company you had was product marketing engineer, which sounds pretty technical. Yeah. Um, it, since you weren't technical yourself, how did you convince people that you would have the ability to actually um, help with the product positioning and messaging for, let's say, a technical audience? And 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 then how did you maybe get the, the language to be able to do that ultimately? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, I think... First off, you'd be surprised at how many people are just love sharing what they do and explaining things to you. And um, I would literally just set up time with our engineers, with our data scientists and preface it with like, hey, I'm about to ask you a bunch of dumb questions. Humor me, you know, and just and and what you find in those types of conversations is that they're not dumb questions. They're actually questions that you know, 50 other people have too. And if I'm asking those questions, imagine what a buyer is going to ask, you know? And at the time, this product we were building, it was, it was based off of a mathematical, like a, a field of mathematics that is complicated even for data scientists. So it was one of those things where like, 
only you know a handful of people in the world specialize in this type of math so it was really really important to share that knowledge and to be able to create marketing frameworks that could explain this product to more people so i think just you know putting your your humility hat or whatever on and just being really humble and asking people you know and and asking smart questions about how the product is being built and why and how it works is that's how I got my start, honestly. And it was painful. It was a lot of uh, information overload. Um, I definitely did a lot of research, you know, simple things. Like if I know that these five people are our competitors, set up Google alerts and do some reading every morning on like what's going on in this industry. And that curiosity, I think just takes you everywhere. Like I mean, I mentioned like the two things that I look for in product marketers with a point of view and connecting the dots. I would say like for really junior people who I know are not going to have like any marketing experience or product marketing experience for that matter. I just look for like, do you have that fire in you, that curiosity where if you don't know the answer to something, you'll go find it, right? Like that's really like that is currency, you know, like being able to to just be a self-starter and, and be curious enough to find the answer to something when when you know, you don't understand something right off the bat is really, really important. And it's a quality that I, I see in like the best product marketers that I know. I think also folks that are listening, this is why a lot of these skills ultimately can only be learned on the job. You can watch videos in the product marketing alliance, you can get certificates and the like, and those are great as a starting point. But if you don't do the next stage of making sure that you're getting your foot in the door with an opportunity where you can actually really learn. And then once you're there, bugging people, asking those questions that are definitely not dumb and making sure that you're downloading data from them and through that process, becoming more data oriented or more technical or whatever it is, that's typically where the accelerated learning happens. But a lot of people, what happens is when they get into a new role, they get really comfortable with a certain set of responsibilities and they kind of, they, they stay um, in that comfort zone and you need to challenge yourself to, to go talk to people, to go bug an engineer, even if you think, well, they're too busy, they don't want to talk to me. Because at the end of the day, you're actually going to make their job easier if you're able to understand what's going on under the hood. Sanjay, San, San, you mentioned the preschool teacher who went to business school, got an internship at Salesforce, is now, now is a successful product marketer. You know, what if in another world, she didn't have business school accessible to her? Um, and, you know, I think by definition, the, the foot in the door at Salesforce would have been more difficult for her to get. How do you think somebody like that could stand out? What could a teacher do to make themselves seem like a viable, even entry-level candidate for a product marketing role and, and get that foot in the door? And, and, and maybe you have an example of someone else that came from a non-traditional background uh, that, you know, stood out to you when you were hiring that I would love to hear any thoughts you have on that. Yeah, I, I think that there are a few ways, right? I think that um, the first thing I'd say is specifically at a place like Salesforce where, you know, we're marketing products where the training is like literally available for free for anyone. I'm always really impressed when people take the time to go and learn about our products before having, you know, an informational chat. Um, you know, while networking is everything, you don't want to just like show up to network for networking sake, right? Like you want to be prepared. You want to show that, you know, there's a reason why you're both there. And so, you know, for instance, for if there are folks on the line that are interested in Salesforce, you know, we have this thing called Trailhead, which is our online learning platform and it's free. You can learn about all of our products and get certified on multiple things for free, um, online. So I think like whether it's Salesforce or any other company, just, showing on your LinkedIn or on your resume that like, hey, like I've, I've actually dove into these concepts and I've, I've, you know, learned something. It, I think that's, that's really um, inspiring. I think also just that act of networking is so important. It sounds so gross, like just like, go, it, it makes you think of like a, a ballroom with like plastic name tags and everyone awkwardly going up to each other. Um, but the reality is, you know, network with people that inspire you. Like if you meet people, meet someone at one of the, you know, these great events that, that you folks um, organize, keep in touch and, you know, come prepared and show, you know, what you're interested in and, and, and be that person that that person's going to think of when they have an open role. You know, like I've seen so many examples of this where people make career changes and it's all about timing and it's all about who's top of mind 
for the person that's doing the hiring. So I think that networking along with doing your homework with just what's out there, like in terms of product training and stuff like that is, is super helpful. I mean, if you can get one of these product marketing alliance, something, you know, trainings, that's great. Right. But if that's also not available to you, there's so much out there that's available. That's free that you can do. Um, I think another thing that I would say is, um, you know, just projects where you can show that you've, you've done some of the, you, you can exhibit some of these core skills. Like maybe you do volunteer work for a nonprofit and you want to help them with their messaging and positioning. I mean, I'll tell you as, as someone that's involved with nonprofits in San Francisco myself, like that's a huge skill that's missing in nonprofits. Like nonprofits need PMMs too, you know? So is there a project you can work on outside of your day job that gets you closer to the career path you want that you can show um, success with? So you can get creative like that. That's a great example. And that's actually exactly what um, uh, a woman named Prabha did who, who spoke with our group. She started a nonprofit. So you don't have to start a nonprofit, but she happened to start a nonprofit in college. And she did all the marketing for it and um, uh, attracted all the folks uh, to her cause and ended up getting a product marketing role at Facebook. And now she's a product manager there. So, wow. you know, you, you don't have to do it for yourself. You can do it for another nonprofit. Reach out to all the ones in your area that you're interested in. I think that's really great advice. Again, though, you got to put yourself out there. Totally. And I love, by the way, what you said about networking. I mean, networking is really just meeting people and trying to talk and see if you can help each other out in some way. Right. Um, and, but, but being deliberate about it, if you ask for a referral to somebody getting to that meeting and like Sanjana said, being prepared because you want to be impressive. You, you don't, you know, just because you got your foot in the door and got that person to talk to you, doesn't mean they're going to want to help you. You need to give them a reason to help you. And by being prepared, by being curious, by asking smart questions about the company and, and showing you're informed, they're going to want to help you. So I, I love that. I love that uh, sort of caveat that, you know, there's a way to do networking that's more effective. And I, I'm curious for you, have you, you know, when you were getting from these different roles from, from startup to startup, and then ultimately going to Salesforce, did you kind of leverage networking as a way to get your foot in the door? Any, any kind of tactics you can share that you did? Every job I've ever gotten has been a function of my network. Um, every single one, every single one. Um, and it was less of me reaching out um, to people I didn't know, um, which is one tactic, right? The other side of that coin is keeping in touch with the people you meet along the way. So, um, you know, it just so happened that a VP that I worked for in my junior year internship um, ended up going to this AI startup that I mentioned, and he needed a junior person in marketing that just was willing to, to do a bunch of things. And, um, you know, I think this was like early-ish days of LinkedIn. I think I just like viewed his profile and liked something and it reminded him that I exist and he, he messaged me, you know? So it's, um, you never know who's going to be important to you along your career path. That's one thing that I've learned. And it's just, I always remind myself of like, of maintaining those relationships with, with people you work with. I mean, I can't tell you how many times like my network has become important for one reason or the other, or I've, you know, gotten an opportunity, whether it's a new job or just, you know, a new connection or, or something like that through someone in my network. And for me in particular, I've stayed in this kind of AI field for a decent amount of time now, and it's really evolved, but the players are the same, you know, like I look around and and the people I worked with nine years ago are still in this space. And I know I can pick up the phone and, and you know, ask them questions or if, if I'm considering a new role, you know, that they become sort of your tribe. So um, I'd say, yes, put yourself out there. But also if you have the opportunity to work with great people, make sure you keep in touch, right? In an authentic way, like not in a weird way. Like don't keep in touch with like everyone, but, um, you know, keep, keep in touch in an, in an authentic way for sure. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I, I think don't give yourself too much pressure, folks, to have to have a running list of everybody that you need to follow up with and, you know, wish a happy birthday. I mean, that's one way to do it for sure. I'm not saying it's the wrong way. But, you know, to your point, you said that you, you viewed his profile and maybe nowadays you have to go a little bit further and like or comment on something that they did. Uh, and it doesn't have to be in a particular cadence, but at the very least, making sure that's top of mind for you to keep those people close somehow. 
um, is a good idea. And if it makes sense to go a step further and maybe catch up with them over coffee sometime or, or a Zoom chat, you can do that with certain people. But also it can be low touch uh, checking in once in a while as a way to stay in touch. So I think that's a, that's a great idea. By the way, folks, uh, we have about 20 minutes left here of this session. So please feel free to start dropping your questions into the chat or uh, you can drop them into the Q&A. If you want everybody to see it, which would be helpful for other people that might have the same question, just make sure that in the two field, everyone is selected. But the question I'm going to ask you now is, you know, I'm curious if you can walk us through maybe a day in the life of a typical product marketer on your team. I know you're a director level now, so you're probably doing a lot of management work too. But for somebody on your team, um, you did say every day is different, but in terms of the most common activities they're doing on a day-to-day -day basis, how would you describe that? Oh, and you're, you're on mute. You, you think we figured this out by now. I'm just constantly putting myself on mute. Um, so I'd say there, there's like kind of different buckets of activities. I'd say one bucket kind of falls into working with product. So um, you know, right now we're in our mode of, of prepping for our big event that we do every year, Dreamforce. And so um, I'm speaking with my PMs, you know, on a, you know, two to three times a week basis, um, just figuring out what are the demos we're going to build um, to showcase the product, um, what are the features we want to show, that sort of thing. So um, talking to product and, um, you know, define, helping them communicate the roadmap and, and um, you know, develop messaging and positioning for what's coming out. Um, that's one piece. I'd say another really important piece of my job is working with um, our press team, our PR team, um, as well as our analyst relations team. And I can describe what that is as well. Um, so on the PR side, um, it's really figuring out like how do we stay top of mind from an external perspective and how do we drive external demand at a really high level um, for the products that we're marketing and that we're selling. Um, so strategizing with PR is a big thing. Um, there's also a core part of product marketing called analyst relations. Um, and um, they're basically it speaks to, you know, there are these analyst firms, like if you've heard of Gartner or Forrester or IDC um, or other firms like that. And their job is to evaluate products and to give advice to large companies like a PepsiCo or, you know, whatever, Unilever, whatever, something like that, on which products to buy for something that they're um, consider a project they're considering doing. And so it's in our vested interest to make sure that our products are seen favorably by those analyst firms so that they can influence future buyers on buying our products instead of our competitors. So um, a big part of product marketing is working with our analyst relations team to brief these analysts on what's new, what's exciting, um, and what should be top of mind for them. So um, that's sort of like the PR and AR bucket. Um, another piece is content. So uh, we obviously have to create a lot of content to support product launches and um, to support, you know, our products in general. So a lot of that is working with our content team on, you know, do we need to develop a white paper? Do we need to develop a data sheet or um, a blog series, stuff like that? Um, and then the last bucket I'd say would be more um, on what I described earlier as like Marcom or de uh, demand generation is another way of saying that, um, of how do we get these messages that we're building, get these, this, these pieces of content that we're building into our larger marketing machine and get those pieces out to customers. Um, the one bucket that I left out, mostly because at Salesforce, our go-to-market function is a little separate, but um, at at many companies, working with sales is going to be a really big part of your day too. Um, so running sales plays, making sure that um, the core messaging and positioning that you've put together for a product can be translated into different sales motions. Um, so getting really tight with your sales leaders, that's definitely um, a part of the product marketing job that was bigger for me uh, at, a, at a startup um, that has sort of lessened for me at Salesforce, but that's just the nature of my current role. So. Got it. Thank you for that. Um, that's really helpful to understand. So, you know, looking at your your background, you started off as a product marketing manager in around 2017. Then you became a senior product marketing manager. And now you're a director of product marketing. Relatively quick trajectory here, about three or four years getting promoted. What do you think you did to contribute most to you being able to 
consistently rise to the ranks. I don't know if you if you talk to this, uh, talk to your boss about this in your 360 or something, but do you were there things proactively that you did in your first year, your second year to increase the likelihood that you'll be the person that's considered to be tapped for these roles, uh, leader, leadership uh, roles internally in the company when when that opportunity came up? Yeah, I mean, I but better question for my for my boss, but um I think it really comes back to those two those two qualities that I mentioned earlier of like having a point of view, connecting the dots because those two qualities imply a lot about a person. Like for example, in my case, I tend to have a strong point of view on our product strategy and our marketing strategy because I've stayed in sort of this like AI and automation space. And um, so I think that like, you don't have to have an industry specialty or be a subject matter expert in product marketing. You don't have to do it. I think it served me well. And it's something that I enjoy having because I, I like diving deep into a subject and, and almost like treating it academically in a sense. Um, so I think that's a part of it. Um, I think the part of connecting the dots is also really, just really important. And I think if you're able to do that effectively, it says that people enjoy working with you. Like people, you know, want to work with you. They want to work on projects that you're on. Um, my sort of like personal mantra, if you will, of like my career is I just want to be someone that people want to work with and work for. Um, and so I focused a lot on the work with part um, up until this, um, you know, getting to this position at Salesforce. And now I'm really focusing on the management skills of, of someone that people want to work for. So um, relationships and kindness take you a long way, I think. I totally agree. And, and, you know, I think it is so important what you mentioned, you, you, the word that has come that you repeated a couple of times is curiosity, which I think is, again, a, maybe underrated, <laughs> but curiosity is so important and having an opinion in particular in this function, but really folks, it's so important for any role, any company, you would be surprised, um, you know, how many people take for granted the fact that being curious and having an opinion matters simply for the fact that it shows that you care, right? You care about the job, you care about the industry, you care about doing a good job. And those are the kind of people that people wanna hire, especially at technology companies, you, you have to care. Um, it, it may seem, I guess, maybe funny to some people like, okay, well, caring about like, you know, CRM software or, or machine learning for CRM software. But the more you dive deep into the value that these kind of products provide for the customers, the more you start caring. And that really shows in the interview processes when you're going through that with some companies. And I want to remind folks to, to, ask, to ask questions in the chat. We have another few minutes here before we'll wrap up. So this is your last chance to ask some questions in the chat here. Um, but, you know, going back now to the fact that you are now a manager, you're, the nature of your job has changed and you're thinking about, you know, how do I make sure that we have the right team in place to, to be able to deliver on our promise to our customers and, and internally here at Salesforce? How do you think about that in terms of hiring? You know, what, what channels are you looking at? What non-traditional experiences are you looking at to bring the people in? Because I'm sure you're looking at resumes all the time. And so I'm sure it's top of mind. Yeah, I mean, just at a macro level, I would consider myself having built a successful team if everyone is different and everyone is better at better than me at product marketing in some way you know whether that's they have a keen eye for design or content or you know maybe they're more technical than I am you know that sort of stuff um because I I you know would never pretend to know everything I think I can guide and coach folks based on my experience but um I think what success looks like as a manager is when you can have the humility to hire people that, you know, should surpass you one day, you know? So that's one part. Um, in terms of what I look for, you know, when I'm looking at resumes and, and all that kind of stuff, I mean, it really goes back to that. I mean, I look at the team that I have and I think about the white space that we have, like, what are the gaps that we have? Do we have people that are um, really strong, have a really strong technical background, but aren't that great at things like content. Okay, that's fine if we have someone that's really strong in content. You know, like it isn't a cookie cutter mold. So I really just look for, for balance. Um, 
I'm trying to build the Avengers, you know, like everyone's <laughs> got their own thing. And I think that that's, that's the beautiful thing about team building. You want everyone to have their own superpower that they bring to the table that they can also be proud of and that they can market for their own career growth. So, you know, and, and, and it's interesting because so, so much of that is kind of internal inside baseball, so to speak, like no job applicant is ever going to know, like, what are the gaps in white space on your team, unless maybe they reach out to somebody on the team, a product marketing manager or a junior person who just got into her role and ask for her advice, see what the role has been like, what's been hard, what are they missing on the team? And then you can use that to better position yourself. So I appreciate you sharing that. We have some um, questions coming in the chat. So we'll start with the first one. Zena, who has a non-technical background, um, just interviewed for a PMM role last week. And she was wondering if you have any advice on how to approach the role on day one as you get started as a new PMM, since there's such a high uh, learning curve in the beginning. So what should, she what should she focus on on day one? Yeah, I think, um, I think getting the list of folks that are... Um, key stakeholders in your product and just meeting with them, developing a cadence that starting to develop a relationship with them is super important. So like find out who your PMs are, become fast friends, um, get a good hold on the roadmap and, and what the priorities are, I think is really, really important. And also get a sense for what is success going to look like in your role. Um, for every product marketing role, it's different. For some folks, it'll be pipe generation for sales, for some folks, it's awareness metrics. Figure out what those priorities are and use that as a way to guide discussions with your stakeholders to really um, find out what's important and just be a sponge. Just, you know, absorb it all. Love that. Uh, Adelaide asked, how often does Salesforce launch new products versus features? And do you create a positioning, new positioning for each feature? Or is this rather done more on the higher product level? Yeah, it kind of depends. It's a good question. Um, for us, we have two big events every year that we do. We do a lot of events, but, um, Dreamforce is our big one. And then Trailhead DX is our developer conference, which happens in like the May, June timeframe. And so those are usually the moments where we have new big products that we launch in terms of features. Um, we have three releases a year at Salesforce. So, um, we do what we call release marketing around, those releases. And sometimes there's little enhancements, but sometimes there are bigger features where we launch them in market, maybe two releases before they're ready to be generally available or GA. Um, and so we'll do some, um, you know, marketing around that general availability um, to customers. So it really depends, but the big product release moments are twice a year and um, the feature release enhancements are three times a year. Got it. Thank you for that. So Jerome, who is a former substitute teacher and business to consumer sales consultant is asking, is there a big difference between the information on Trailblazer versus paid certifications for Salesforce? Yeah, so, um, so on Trailhead, all of that is free information that will help you with your certification. Your certification is much like, you know, um, I don't know what the equivalent would be, like maybe like in a, some sort of degree you might get because it's like a widely recognized thing. So like if you say that you're certified on uh, being a Salesforce admin, it means like, I think there's a paid component. I think it's like a couple hundred bucks or something. Um, and it's a rigorous exam. So like if you wanted to be a solutions consultant at Salesforce or a sales engineer, you know, that's actually, I think like a minimum requirement. Like you have to be certified as an admin. Um, because you just have to be able to, to exhibit those technical skills for, for the products. So um, that's really the, the key difference is one is free, one is paid. And also the paid version is um, kind of like a industry standard, if you will. And um, by the way, if that's something that you're interested in and um, you're not able to, to pay for it, there are um, kind of like scholarship programs and, and, and different ways that are accessible on the Trailhead site where you can find out how you can get sponsored and stuff like that. So definitely look into that. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, Dale asked a question. I'm going to rephrase a little bit here, but um, when it comes to, let's say, something that you would do with influencer marketers, right, which is becoming popular now mm -hmm. in terms of increasing brand awareness, how does that fit into, I guess, some of the work that a product marketer might do when they're uh, working towards a launch? Or is that separate from you in the marketing team? Um, 
It's not something I've ever done, mostly because we're we're B two B marketing, and um, hey, maybe there'll be a day soon where you know there's CRM influencers. I mean, but I will say in that same vein, like our we have sort of created like a a, a large actually community and ecosystem of folks that have have learned how to use Salesforce and built their careers on Salesforce. And we call them our trailblazers. And they're kind of like our influencers. You know, whenever we have a new product release or something like that, we tell them first, like they're the ones that we want briefed on these new products so they can go and evangelize for us. So it's not like, you know, an Instagram influencing type of thing, but it's the closest thing I got. So. Mm, no, it, it sounds actually very relevant. Uh, you're yeah. right. Though, in a B2B context, it's a different animal to reach those customers. And so it all depends on the lens that you're looking through. Okay. That's great. Um, okay. Drew asked a very simple question, but I love it. Uh, and I, I want to hear your thoughts. What is the best way to get a role at Salesforce? Oh. <laughs> what kind of role, Drew? <laughs> great follow-up. <laughs> Throw it back at you. Uh, yeah, it really depends on the type of role, man. Um, I, I, I think for product marketing, um, especially if you have a non-traditional background, network, because we get so many resumes. Oh, and you're asking about customer success. Um, hmm. I don't actually know the real answer to that, but I will say one trick or tip rather is that most of the roles that are posted online have a cap to the amount of resumes that they will take before they remove the role from the website. So if you see something that is really interesting to you, drop your resume in and try to find folks within that group, whether it's on LinkedIn or whatever, that you can network with to find out more because that role could get taken down in two days and you wouldn't have even had the opportunity for a recruiter to screen you. So um, yeah, I would definitely do that. Great advice. We always, we always teach that in our programs to figure out if application is kind of far for the course, you have to do it, but figure out how you get your foot in the door in the organization so that you can at least get someone's attention. Um, Pooja asked a very specific question. I think this is going to be our last question, but um, maybe other folks could be curious. How close does product marketing work with developer advocacy evangelism, uh, specifically for technical products, especially? Uh, very closely, um, depending on the product, of course, but, but pretty closely. Um, I'd say for my job in particular, um, our core user base are what we call our Salesforce admins. And so um, they're not quite developers. Um, some of them go on to become Salesforce developers, not like traditional developers, but Salesforce developers. Um, and so our admins are everything. Like when we want to do message testing, um, they're the ones that will call BS on our messaging first, right? Like they, they don't want to hear the marketing fluff. They want to hear what's really coming out. And so um, I would say like, they're really like thought partners for us. And so we do have dedicated admin and developer evangelism teams um, at Salesforce that we work super closely with because they know the user groups, they know the trailblazers, they know the influencers um, that um, can help us evangelize, you know, the, the messages that we're putting out there for our products. Excellent. Thank you for that. Uh, and now we're at the last minute mark here. So we'll wrap up with the questions for here. Thank you folks, by the way, for dropping all these insightful questions. Uh, thank you, Sanjana, for all the insight that you provided, uh, at least from my perspective and hopefully from everybody's here. It does really feel like these roles are pretty accessible if you find the right way to A, position yourself, but B, to take on those projects, to build that network, to make sure that you're you know, make, make sure that you're advancing yourself in whatever role that you're in and the responsibilities that you take on that will then help you be successful in this role because it's highly dynamic, uh, similar to product management. You're working with a lot of different stakeholders. You're really in the middle of it all. Even when you talked about the day in the life, there's just so much there that I'm sure prioritizing your work every day, since you're being pulled in different direction is a challenge in and of itself. Uh, but congratulations, obviously, on being at Salesforce and becoming a director there in a short amount of time. Uh, and we're excited to continue following your progress and really, really thankful for all the insight that you uh, shared with us here today. No, thank you so much for having me. And I'll just say that, you know, your resume and the way you reach out to people, that's the greatest messaging and positioning exercise out there. So like if you're applying for a product marketing role, think about the way you're positioning yourself in your resume. Maybe you got to make some tweaks. Maybe you got to contextualize some of your experience differently. Um, but good luck to everyone. And, um, you know, feel free to share my, I can share my, 
my email information and stuff in the chat if, if folks um, have other questions. That'd be great. Thank you so much for, for offering to do that. While you're doing that, I'm going to make a few quick final announcements here, folks. Again, if you're interested in our program and you haven't applied yet, uh, you're going to see some links in the chat right now that Kristen was kind enough to drop. So we encourage you to apply as the deadline is coming up soon. Please do provide your feedback. Uh, go to school16.co forward slash survey on today's session. Uh, and if you have any feedback on what we could have done better, please let us know. We, we don't mind. We don't get upset at negative feedback. So please do let us know. Uh, and if, you, if, if it's something in particular really stood out that you really liked, let us know as well. Uh, you can follow us on social on Instagram, school16co and LinkedIn. Just type in school16. We pop up as a school there uh, to find out about more events like this. And feel free, please, to RSVP and join us for next week's event with Alexandra Wu, who's a senior product manager at Etsy. Very different. Today, we talked about B2B. Uh, that is a B2B to C type of company. And so other challenges there as well for a product management role, if you're interested in those types of functions in tech. So that's it for today. Thanks again so much for joining us. Thank you, everybody else, for joining us for the hour. And we'll see you soon. Thank you all. Thanks, Angela. Thank you. Bye-bye.